So hello and welcome to my April live Mokume Q&A chat. Uh, we're going to be, and I'm going to be answering interesting questions about Mokume Gane for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to do a short patterning overview with some images and uh, then talk about uh, the different types of patterning. And I'm going to be answering questions that have come in over the last three or four days. I gave you guys some warning this time. Um, this is a about a monthly show is what I'm trying to do, uh, just answering Mokumegane questions. So, so I'll be answering them as I go along. And um, yeah, um, let's see a bit about me. My name is Anne, Anne Wolf, and I've been doing Mokumegane since 2007. Um, and it's become my main mode of income for sure right now. Um, I'm about half and half uh, um, making rings and teaching the techniques uh, to other folks uh, for down the road. So. Uh, I really, Mokume is something that I truly love and I think my enthusiasm for it kind of comes through when I'm, when I'm teaching or, or uh, making rings or any of that. So, so let's see, I'll go ahead and get started by sharing my screen with the um, PowerPoint that I intend to show to that, there we go. So now hopefully what we are seeing on the screen and what will be recorded is just my face and the screen. So yeah, so just so you know, you guys know, I can't see the chat window anymore. I can't see nothing except my screen. <laughs> so so pipe up if you have a question uh, or mute if you, uh, if you are making uh, any extraneous noise. All right, so here we go. Um, I am gonna be talking first so you guys know what it you know i'm not going to go much into like what is mokume or fusing mokume because that we talked a lot about fusing mokume last month and i can't cover everything all the time so basically i just want to say briefly that mokume gane is a technique not a material so you can make mokume gane from whatever metals you want um, and it's layers of metal fused together with time, heat, and pressure. Um, today, I'm talking mostly about non-ferrous metals, uh, copper, brass, silver, gold, that sort of thing. Um, but certainly Mokumegane can be made with other, other materials as well. It can be made with titanium, it can be made with iron, um, and, but um, more the, the materials that I have the most experience with are uh, copper, brass, silver, or gold. So we're talk we're going to be talking about patterning the mokumegane um, in either sheet or rod form, and these are just some general numbers. So a lot of the sheet that I use is between 25 and 30 layers. And a lot of the rod that I use is between 17 and 25 layers. I think you can see on the screen on the right, you can see actually that will look the cross section of the um, rod. You can actually see the layers there. It's a close up image. This rod is only a quarter inch um, across, but it's blown up so that you can see the layers. So, um, and the uh, sheet on the left is about 1.6 millimeters thick. Um, that's just one example of a dimension that is good to start patterning. Some people pattern much thicker, like three millimeters or even five millimeter thick sheet. You could um, pattern rod that was smaller or larger than this, and you could pattern both sheet and rod with fewer or many more layers. You're just going to get a different effect. So the, this, this is uh, some raw materials that I uh, uh, use quite a bit. All right. Oh, and so um, let's see. Um, I, I thought this would be fun. I didn't say this before, but I, I wanted to actually give you a little sneak preview of some patterning. Um, these are actually taken from my online classes. They're just some little, uh, one little um, snippet uh, that I wanted to show you, especially for folks that might not be at all familiar with what Mokumegane is or how it's done. And actually this is, this little unit is a good way, a good time to address my first question that I got. And this first question, I'll read it for you in a sec. I actually received last month and I never got to it because we got so many questions. So uh, to the fellow that asked it, see, I didn't forget you. <laughs> and, and here we are. So um, this fellow's question was, once you've either hammered or chiseled or stamped or drilled into your billet, those are all ways to pattern, then what? I'm confused about the next step. Do I file until the indents are gone? Then do I mill or both? 
and in what order? That's a very big question to answer. And so I'm kind of gonna be answering that question for the next 40 minutes. Um, but I thought that this would be a good way to start addressing that question. And of course the answer is, for those of you that have taken my classes before, you know this is coming. The answer is, it depends. <laughs> Because it depends which of those techniques you've done. So for instance, if you're chiseling, you would chisel first and then you would hammer back flat and then you would um, roll. Um, but if you hammer first, then you file next. And the thing to keep in mind is that the Mokumegane, as we're looking at it, the layers are all parallel. So the layers here in this piece of Mokume are parallel to the plane of the metal. And we have to somehow get down into the layers below so that we can see a pattern. That's the whole point of Mokume. And there are many ways to do that. So in this example, what I'm going to do is take this hammer and create hills and valleys, basically disturb the surface of this metal. Um, and I'll go ahead and um, start the hammering. Let's see, I wanna make sure that it's not too loud that I can't talk over. I'm showing how not to put, how not to hammer there. You don't wanna hammer your thumb. So I put my thumb off the edge of the anvil. So I'm using a cross peen um, ha steel hammer to just create um, basically hills and valleys in a pattern on the metal. I'm wanting to hammer strongly with slightly overlapping blows so that I create these nice hills and valleys. This is one of the fastest ways to pattern that I've found and it's really great fun. Of course, it's not very specific. You're not gonna draw a picture of a tree with this, for instance, um, but, uh, but it's a good way to pattern a lot of metal fairly quickly. Uh, boy, I can start addressing everyone's questions as I go along. There was another question um, that asked um, um, if I have a billet with 11 layers in it and I want it to be a millimeter thick when I'm done, at what thickness should I start patterning? And um, that question is relevant here because um, this type of patterning would not work at all well with a lower number of layers, like 11 layers. This type of patterning works well, and I'll go to the next slide. Um, here it is close up, just so you can see those hills and valleys that I've made. Um, the valleys are not that deep, the hills are not that high. So if I only had 11 layers in this metal, um, I wouldn't get much of a pattern. This metal was, is 1.6 millimeters thick right now and it has 27 layers. So the mathy of you could do, go ahead and do that calculation and figure out how thick each layer is, okay? Um, but, um, but again, so, that, so the question with the 11 layers, I would just say, it, it, um, uh, again, it depends. This, is, this material might only be, it might still be a millimeter thick when we're done, but I wouldn't do this technique with something that was only 11 layers. All right. All right, so now I've created those hills and valleys. Go back for a second. Um, you can even think, you can think of it as hills and valleys, or you can think of it as choppy seas, but basically the layers are no longer in a straight line because that top surface isn't flat. So now my next job is to go in and reveal those layers that, that I've made into choppy seas. So um, I'm taking uh, a vise just to hang on to the metal and then a file here and I'm taking off the top. So it, that first question where he asked where he was confused which, which order to do it in, here we're, we've deformed the layers first with our hammer. And so now we're removing the layers with the file and that's the correct order for that type of pattern. I actually teach this type of patterning in my online class called Metamorphic Mokume. Um, and I, I use the word metamorphic because it's um, uh, the processes of patterning Mokume remind me so much of the geologic processes of the earth. So metamorphic rock is rock that's been moved and changed and, and um, through uplift um, uh, to create um, patterns in the rock. So it just made sense to call um, something like this metamorphic. But really, meta my I, I coined this term metamorphic mokume as really kind of a catch-all term for things that don't fit in other categories. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. So another part magic of being on video here is, whoa, look how fast I can file. 
<laughs> so um, that video was it like a minute and 50 seconds, almost uh, maybe two minutes long. It doesn't take long if you're using a nice rough file. So I've taken off the highlights and I've gotten to the point where it's just a little bit shiny. Here's a nice close up of what that looked like when I was done filing. You can still see just a little few areas where my hammer is, um, but, and, and those areas will be the top layer of the mokume, right? In this case, this mokume is copper and brass. And so the top layer is copper. And now I won't bore you with the uh, uh, next step, but on the left here, um, after all that filing, I needed to refine the surface. So I went ahead and used a sanding disc to refine that surface. You could hand sand it as well. Um, and then on the right, is what the pattern looks like after annealing. So copper, when you anneal it, goes dark black from the fire scale and the brass stays that bright, shiny yellow. Um, it is a different process to actually put a patina, a final finish on the mokume to make the color stand out and look different permanently. Um, but I'm not gonna go into that today because this is all about patterning. So that's just um, creating the, the patterning. So, um, so yeah, um, that was a good little introduction, I think, and um, uh, at least beginning to address that fellow's question. Uh, Morrissey, thank you for the question of which step do you do when and all of that. All right, so now I'd like to go over just the main categories of patterning as I see them. It makes sense to talk about chisel patterning first because chisel patterning was the um, first kind of patterning uh, invented by the Japanese back in the 1600s. Um, and so it seems appropriate to, to talk about it first. It's also one of the most versatile and um, uh, expressive forms of patterning. You can see the image that I've chosen here is, um, these are three different samples that I've made in three different chisel patterning classes, uh, just using the chisel on um, on some copper brass mokume. I'm not much of a, a drawer, you know, but this kind of abstract stuff is good. I can do that. Um, but you, so you can see the chisel can give you really quite detailed um, specific uh, patterns. The I will say for the sample that you're seeing here, those samples were a two inch by one inch piece of 27 layer Mokamegane at 1.6 millimeters thick. Uh, and that's how I teach chisel patterning when I do teach the online classes for it. Um, a lot of people chisel thicker than this, maybe three millimeters, even four millimeters thick. And that is probably more traditional Japanese. I've adapted my chisel teaching to kind of the, the, the US um, 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 workshop, you know, uh, what works for folks. And um, starting to chisel thicker, you actually need to do it twice. And it's a little more complicated and tricky. So I, I created a workshop where you can actually get finished uh, pattern, pattern pieces done pretty quickly. Um, so this piece, um, this um, object on the left, of course, is the chisel that I made and used to make the patterns here. And now I'll go ahead and address uh, Dale's question, which I thank you, which I thank you for. So he asked, he, he took my online chisel uh, workshop and he found during, while he was working, he tended to make the lines too thin, um, but then when he tried to widen them, he ended up making them deeper instead. So, um, that, and then so he asks how, how if, if I could talk a little bit about line width and the different ways to vary that. So yeah, you will see that, you know, for instance, this, this chisel line is pretty, is pretty narrow. Um, and even so, I think that maybe um, uh, it's wider than what Dale is talking about. So he made really quite a, a, a narrow channel. And I guess what I would say is that, um, uh, let me see. If you guys can, I don't know if you can see me, but um, I have a little tray of chisels that I'm showing up in this in this in my small window here. Um, there are so many different chisel shapes, and teaching a, a chisel patterning workshop, uh, I had to make the chisel for you, right? But I wasn't going to make like five, so I made one, and I made the V chisel because the V chisel is the easiest to control. The V gets down in there and it stays in the channel, and you can really work and control it well. What it's not so great at is giving you a broad pattern. So 
what's happening with Dale is that he's gotten to the first level. He's used the V chisel, it's working great. Now he wants more detail. He wants to refine his technique and that's understandable. So the so what he would wanna do is the next channel. So he could go a channel with the V chisel. And then if you are uh, good with control, what you do basically is make another channel right next to it right, right next to it. So you're not actually even out of the channel. You're just creating a second V, right? Uh, a second uh, deepest mark right next to the other one, if you follow me. So you're working on the, so I, I'm holding up my hands into a V. This is your first channel. Um, so you would do that first. Now, second time, you don't want to go right back into that same channel because then you'd have what Dale said is happening. You would just get the whole thing deeper. So instead you want to shift everything over just a little bit. So your chisel is going to go back along the interior sidewall of your first chisel line. And that might sound like really down in the weeds and, and detailed, but um, you can do it. Uh, people do it all the time. Of course, um, one of my mentors and um, person I looked up to, Ford Hallam, uses chisels to do the most delicate of uh, you know, uh, tiger whiskers and uh, Zen Buddhist monk faces. Um, so the kind of chiseling that we're doing in Mokume is really pretty crude actually, because we're just bashing it to, to reveal the pattern and then, or just, you know, uh, removing material to see the pattern, then we're hammering it back flat. So um, we don't need to be nearly as precise as Port Hallam, but, um, but we do need to uh, widen the channel sometimes. So, so, so if you only have one chisel, that's your only option is to go back the second time along the, the one side of that uh, channel. So now you have basically a, 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 a channel that you've widened, but you haven't deepened. Um, your other option of course would be to make a new chisel um, and let's see, I'll hold up. Uh, these chisels are by Earl Bushy. Now, I don't think you're going to be able to really see them. You might be able to. Um, just very, very shallow curves. You can see the light shining off those curves, I think. Now, these make lovely broad channels that you can really see the colors change. Unfortunately, they're not easy to control. So I would not put this kind of chisel in a beginner, in a chisel patterning kit for online chisel patterning because um, people wouldn't get anything out of it because they wouldn't be able to get the, keep the chisel in the metal or control its curves. It's, uh, so um, what, what Dale might do is um, make uh, a rounded chisel, maybe not quite as broad as this one, and then go back into that V channel with the rounded chisel so that the V channel is a, um, a guide uh, but the second chisel comes back and opens uh, everything up more broad, but without getting too deep. Uh, all right, now um, next question about chisels, about um, next question that came in was what's the best way to hold the chisel? And um, there, um, there seems to be um, two camps in how to chisel. There is the um, uh, hold, it, hold it in your fist and whack one side and, and, and whack the end. Um, and then there is the hold it toward you. So I, I'm definitely of the hold it so that I can see what's happening. And so I will grab the chisel in my first uh, two fingers with my thumb opposing to, so I can really um, control the angle well. And then uh, also you're holding in your non-dominant hand, right? So I'm left-handed, so I'm holding the chisel in my right hand. And then your hammer, which, um, let's see. You can use a proper Japanese hammer, but a, a nice little chasing hammer works great uh, for this as well. And you are hammering. Uh, so for me, again, because I'm left-handed, I'm going to be at like um, 10 o'clock to two o'clock, my hammer. If you're on the face of a clock, if you're right-handed, it's going to be more like 12 o'clock to two o'clock is your is where you're going to be so that you can watch the chisel as it's coming toward you. That's the, um, that's the way I do. And I think you have the most control that way. Um, it's a lot like chasing in repousse actually in that people tend to hold the chisel too tight and then they end up with a lot of fatigue in their holding hand for the chisel. Um, but if you keep the angle correct, you can relax your holding hand a lot more. Uh, right. uh, let's see, I'm looking back along. Uh, 
Uh, all right, let's go on to the next type of, of patterning and that is stamp patterning. And um, I do a, an online class in this as well. This is the easiest kind of Mokumegane patterning. And so I always encourage folks that are pretty new to Mokume or even completely new to metalworking to go for this one um, because it's a little more easy to understand and you get your effects pretty, pretty quickly. So on uh, the left, you see three finished bracelets that I made with the technique. And what I love about these bracelets bracelets is that you can look on the inside and really see how it was done. So if you see like this one closest to the center of the image, you see a, a dot. Basically, I just took a, a dot tool and stamped into it on the on the reverse side on wood. All right. Here I'm on wood, a bump forms on the top surface. I file that bump off and then I see like a target pattern like like you see right here. I've got my cursor on there. And that's the basic premise of stamp patterning. Now, of course, um, let, let me uh, use an analogy too that can be useful sometimes. So my stamp is like uplift. So it's a hill forming. And then my file is erosion. It's eroding the hill away to see the different colors of the metal beneath. All right. Um, so refining this can be tricky because of course, if you hammer too deep, or if you file too much, you can create a thin spot in your metal. Uh, so, so it can be tricky in that way. Um, also, the metal needs to be thin enough that it will actually move when you stamp. So really one point, about one millimeter to 1.3 millimeters is about as thick metal as you can use for this, this technique. And that means it's kind of self-limiting. Um, it's not really appropriate for large vessels because um, the metal is not very thick when you're done with it. If it's, it's often when you're completely finished, it might only be 20 gauge or 22 gauge thick. That's great for jewelry, um, like 0.8 millimeter, I should say is 20 gauge. Um, but uh, so great for jewelry, but not so great for larger vessels. So this kind of patterning is not popular or even well known at all in Japan um, because they, they like a, a he heavier stock for their vessels for sure. But so, um, so this is kind of an American thing. Um, and let's see. Um, oh, um, let me ask, uh, let me answer a question. Um, when do I anneal? That's a good question, certainly. And um, mm -hmm. you wanna anneal after you have somehow hardened the metal, but before the next step. So I talked to, uh, or I, I addressed Morrissey's question about, you know, do you hammer or chisel and then do you file and then do you mill? Basically, um, after any kind of operation where you have hammered, then you want to anneal before the next operation. So even with the stamp patterning, um, you can see me doing my stamping on the right here. After I do all that stamping, I'm going to go ahead and anneal it before I um, before I hammer it flat. Right? I could stamp, then file, then anneal because the filing your file doesn't care whether the metal's been annealed or not. So I would say in this case, the order that I would do this patterning is: I would stamp, I would file. I would anneal because the annealing, as you saw in that image a little earlier, can often um, make the pattern come out in sharp relief. So you can really see how your patterning is coming along. Um, all right, so basically with annealing, you wanna anneal uh, like you normally would uh, with perhaps a little bit more often because you are dealing with material that's been bonded together. You wanna treat it a little more gently so you might not uh, stress it out quite as much before you anneal. All right, so stamp patterning. Um, now here, twist patterning, and, and I'll address um, another question I got just this morning, right before I uh, came on to you guys. Um, uh, I was asked, I was told uh, this person uh, went ahead and uh, bought some of the pre-made rods, which you can buy from Reactive Metals here in the U.S., uh, lots of different kinds of um, uh, Mocha Megana, you can buy quarter inch or six millimeter stock. And she bought one or and a half or two inches. And then she wants to learn to pattern it. So twist patterning is the way 
that you would pattern rod for sure. And uh, I just have a short image up here. I can't teach you how to twist pattern right now, right? Because you know it's it's a this is a short uh, program that addresses a lot of different questions. But just a brief overview is just that uh, here is a, a a rod that I have annealed, uh, secured one end in a vise and the other end in some vise grips, and then I'll twist it. Uh, you know, um, uh, probably a length this long, I could twist two full turns before it gets work hardened, then I would anneal, and then I could choose to twist it again, or to forge it flat. Um, if I just for if I just twist it, and then forge it flat, all I will get is a candy stripe. Right. So you're looking at a bottom, and then the side and then the top and then the side of the rod. In order to get all of this fun stuff, you got to remove material as well. So there's always in patterning Mokume, there's always um, um, moving the metal, like deforming it or forging it. And there's always removing material. Those two things go hand in hand to create the patterns. So in this case, the, the deforming or the moving happens first. And then, um, then the abrading or removal stock material happens second. But then there's also a third step if you're removing a bunch of material, now you've created a surface that has hills and valleys, then you squish those back flat, you forge them down to lock the pattern in. Um, so that's just the broad overview of, uh, of twist patterning. And oh, and she said also that she's looking for the wood look pattern. And, and that makes me uh, a, a say out loud what Mokume Gane means, right? Mokume Gane means wood grain or wood eye metal. And um, so the patterns often look like patterns in, in, in wood or wood grain. And the um, twist patterning is most classically done here in the US to make custom wedding rings, which is what I spend a lot of my time doing. Um, and, and we call that the wood grain. Uh, uh, texture or wood grain look. Um, now people, Mokume artists from all over the world can call anything um, what they want, right? They can call their, um, their Mokume wood grain and then another Mokume artist might call a different type of, of pattern wood grain. So it just depends on what you think it looks like. And if you think it looks like wood grain, call it wood grain, <laughs> but, but know that the very name Mokume Gane means wood grain um, or mo Mokume more literally means wood eye metal, but uh, a general translation means wood grain. Okay. Um, let's see, I've got another question. Um, uh, is it better to flatten with a rolling mill or forge with a hammer, which is a great, Great question. And let's switch to metamorphic patterning and, and, uh, and then I will answer that question. So these are just some fun images for you to look at while I talk about these, these topics. But um, this, per, this um, image on the left is done with that direct hammer method that I showed you earlier in the video. And um, uh, it's just uh, easy, direct to do. Um, it was um, done by, as you remember, the cross paint hammer and then the filing off. So when you're done with this kind of pattern, the metal is actually, you can see that, um, the metal is actually um, pretty even in, in thickness, right? Because you made those up and downs and then you filed off the surface. So it's already pretty um, even in thickness. And in that case, I would say, Go ahead, if you want to put this piece in the rolling mill, go ahead and do that. Um, now, here's, um, here's another piece. This is um, also a technique that I teach in the metamorphic online class. And here I use steel wires to hammer down, and I hammer them down into the metal and stamp tools used from the front on steel, pushed down, and then I file a whole bunch of the surface off. This one also, means that when I'm done patterning, the metal is pretty consistent, even thickness. In this case, it's fine to go ahead and use the rolling mill first. But a lot of the patterning that we do, chisel patterning, stamp patterning, and after you're done um, creating the pattern, you have stock, you, you have sheet that has real different thicknesses, thicker, and then when you, where you chiseled is thinner. In that case, you should not put it through the mill first because you could tear it apart. Remember the mill 
is two two round uh, two cylinders and you're pushing the metal and you're and you're rolling the metal through it that means it's a sheer force it's pulling the metal in two directions and so it's quite stressful on the metal really to do that and if you have these thick and thin spots you could very easily tear the metal where the thin spots are forging the metal is a lot gentler thing to do to your metal so um i almost always forge my metal after patterning before I put it through the mill. I think always, I think I always do that. Uh, all right, so, so the question was, is it better to flatten with a rolling mill or forge with a hammer? I, I do both, but it's just, you just have to keep in mind what each one of those processes will do. The, the mill will go in one direction, the hammer pushes down and it's much more gentle. So oftentimes if I get the metal all patterned and it's looking good, but it's still a millimeter and a half thick and I only need it to be a millimeter thick, I'll roll it. I'll, I'll roll it in one direction. I'll anneal it, turn it 90 degrees, roll it in the other direction because now I have more material and the pattern is more spread out and more broad. Um, so I definitely use both of those things when I'm, when I'm, when I'm patterning. Um, let's see, I think I'm going to look at, it, at the chat. Let's see, um, we've got some more questions that came through. Um, so uh, from Cynthia, uh, while she's doing stamp patterning, she lays paper under the metal. Oh, okay. You know, I would say to that, I would say whatever works, right? Um, but yeah, I've always just done it on wood. Um, you also could put a piece of leather underneath. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting, Cynthia. Um, and then Annette asks, uh, what grit sandpaper used to finish? Um, that's a good question too. We'll allow that. Um, I was thinking that, you know, next month might be finishing and patinas, but, um, but we can, so the, the grit sandpaper, I only, I only use um, two grits of sandpaper, really. I use 280 and 400. Um, and that's because Mokume, shouldn't really be a high polish finish when you're done anyway, because then it's, you're just going to see shiny things. You're not going to see, um, you're not going to see the pattern. So, um, so yeah, I, I generally use first a file and then I use, um, um, the sand, those little sanding discs, and those are probably 180. Um, and then I use 280 sandpaper and then I use 400 sandpaper. Um, that's the minimum. Gosh, when I was in school, you know, we learned to, you know, first you use 180 and then you use 240 and then you use 320 and then you use 400 and then you use 600 and it's all in different directions, right? And when you get to 600, then you can go in circles and then you start with the polishing. Um, but that's when you're headed for a, a smooth, shiny piece of metal with no scratches in it. Um, but with the Mokume, you want a satin finish. So you don't have to go to as high a grit sandpaper, which is great news because Mokume is labor intensive in all of its other aspects. So it's nice that you don't have to spend quite as much time on the, on the finer grits of sandpaper. Um, and then let's see, uh, what else? Oh, at what temperature should one anneal a Mokume Gane billet and for how long? Um, and uh, sorry, I don't have a picture of this because you know I can't get everything all because um, uh, you know you know what do you want? It's it's worth the price of admission, right? Uh, so no picture today. But um, when I anneal mukamegane, I always use a what I call an annealing cave. Basically, I just take two pieces of solderite board and some um, uh, K23 fire brick and a little surround on three sides so that I'm inside a little cave when I anneal. And you'll see that on almost all my videos when, I'm, when I do my teaching, um, my online classes, I, I show annealing. And I anneal to a dull red. Um, a dull red means about 1300 Fahrenheit or 700 Celsius. And um, most of the metal, most of the mokume that I'm annealing has silver in it. So it's very important I don't go over that temperature. Um, oh, the person also asked for how long. And it depends on the size of the billet or the mokume that you are annealing. If it's a big chunk, then you really do have to spend, get, get it to stay red. What I was taught actually um, um, by, by Earl and Jean here who are, are in, the, in the audience, um, when I'm annealing my mokume, you wanna take your torch away and see what happens. If it immediately goes 
push back to black, that means that there's a, like a cool spot, a cool shadow in the middle of your chunk of metal. So that means you gotta give it some more heat, right? So give it some more heat, take your torch away, look at the color. If the color holds for a little while, then you're probably good. You've gotten it hot all the way to the center. Another way to say that would be to say, hold it at that temperature for 30 seconds for smaller pieces, a minute for longer pieces. Oftentimes when I'm teaching, I don't emphasize that because what I've found is that students will overheat the metal if I tell them that. Um, and I'd rather have you underheat it than overheat it. With silver, if you accidentally overheat when you're annealing, if you go to 1430 Fahrenheit, that's the eutectic temperature between which copper, silver and copper-based alloys will start to form their own alloy in between, uh, that you'll actually start to melt to your mokume. So um, these are all instructions for silver-based mokume. For mokume that doesn't have any silver in it, if it's um, uh, all the base metals like copper, nickel, brass, you can go much hotter. You could go to 1500 Fahrenheit if you want. It's fine, no problem. Um, but um, just be sure that you don't go to the melting temperature. So you stay below the melting temperature of the lowest um, material in your billet. That sounds great with the exception of when you have silver in your in your billet, because of course the melting temperature of silver is 16 something. But if you get anywhere near that, you're going to melt your billet. Um, so it's tricky, Mokume. If it was if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? Um, all right, I think that might be. Oh no, now I have some just some fun things. Um, so um, today we were talking about patterning, and um, I just wanted to give a nod to this piece because um, this is a piece that current um, Mokume artists have been interested in trying to recreate. This was made in the Edo period in Japan by Takahashi Okitsugu. Um, and the, uh, it's, you can see the cherry blossoms, right? Right in there, right? And right, um, if you, done mokume pattern patterning for any length of time, the more you understand about mokume patterning, the more you respect this pattern and how difficult it was to achieve. Um, and uh, so, so it's something that um, uh, mokume artists try to recreate. And uh, I've been working on that and my friend uh, uh, Earl has also been working on that. So um, uh, on the upper left here is just a, a a uh, blow up of that, that Suba, that uh, sword guard that you just saw a minute ago. Um, and um, you can see those little, isn't that so lovely seeing those little ripples around each cherry blossom. It's like the cherry blossom on the water. And then here down the left, this is my uh, first uh, uh, successful uh, uh, attempt at this. Little different, the little ripples are closer together. That gives me information. I know what I need to do next to make it better. And then uh, here are ginkgo, ginkgo leaves and koi um, by Earl, uh, also working on, on recreating that. So that's something I'm working on in my future is I want to make a, a suba uh, with, this, uh, with this cherry blossom pattern and uh, I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> everything takes longer than you think, right? But, uh, but I'm working on it. And let's see, I think the last, this is the last slide with the recording and I think I'll stop recording uh, soon and then uh, we'll do a little bit more unscripted uh, question and answer period. But um, in fact, while that, that, while that screen is up, let me check the chat and see what else is going on. Um, ah, this is a great question. So Earl asks, do I quench my piece after annealing? And no, I do not. Um, the, you know, uh, I always try to teach and then even act in my own practice in such a way where I have uh, safety, like I'm like I'm extra extra careful with mokume. So um, you could probably quench mokume after annealing if you're really careful and you do it in a particular way. One of those ways would be wait until it's cool enough that it's a it's black heat now. You've lost all the red. That means it's below 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now you could get one of those little infrared guns, um, or you could just wait. <laughs> You know, but what I do with my mokume is um, I just set it on a cold anvil. And if I'm really impatient, I'll put a, torque, a cold torque plate on top of it and that'll pull the heat out really quickly, but not so quickly that it might stress the metal out. Um, so, so definitely with uh, any billet that has silver in it, that's my process. I don't 
if I quench, it's below 800 degrees Fahrenheit, um, or I just cool it on the anvil. Now with um, the, all the bait with base metal, uh, copper, brass, nickel, you can quench it um, and, and it's usually just fine, but I don't teach that way in my classes because oh, I yeah. want yeah, I want, I know everyone's been like, wait a minute. Um, but, but I want you to learn, um, you can try it. I did, I did. way that silver is okay. Right. right. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. You didn't by chance go to the CVS to get silver. I did. You did. Oh, okay. Hang on. Okay. Whoever's going to the CVS, okay. can you mute yourself? Yeah. Cause we've got. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, thank you. So, um, so anyway, thank you, uh, Earl. That was a, a, a great question. And um, as I was saying in my classes, I want to teach in such a way that I give you a little extra safety when you start working with silver mokume. Um, train yourself in the copper brass so that when you go to using the silver, you don't have to adjust anything. So that's why in my classes, you don't see me quenching Mokume at all, because I just don't want you to get into a, a risky habit uh, that will make you sad later. Uh, so um, I'll just um, end the recording by uh, giving a little plug for my next online class, which is chisel patterning. And it's at, uh, in really not that far away. Uh, today's the second, so it's in 22 days. Uh, so if you are interested in attending, uh, I've got lots of signups already, but we do still have room. But let me know and get uh, registered by April 8th so that I can get the kit uh, made up and out to you. Um, okay, so I think, oh, let's see if there's anything else I wanna answer before. Um, other questions? Um, oh, I have one last, I have one last question that, um, that was asked. When you're chisel patterning, um, you end up with all of these little chips. Um, and uh, I was asked, can you do something useful with them? I have no idea. I have never found anything useful to do with them. Really what they seem to do is they get stuck in my shoes, they get stuck in my, in my pant legs, um, and then they get stuck on my tabletop and then I hurt myself with them. Uh, so I've never found anything useful to do with them. However, I, um, I did note that um, uh, Norio Tamagawa, who is the top guy in, in, in Mokumegane, uh, National Living Treasure of Japan, um, he uses not the chips from, from uh, the chiseling, those are too small, but he uses the little off cut ends. So if you have, if you're, if you need a circle, cause you're making a vessel uh, and you've, you've uh, forged out a square of Mokume, you've got these funny little, little shapes, little triangle shapes, right? What, what Mr. Tamagawa does is he'll take those and he'll put them on a piece of silver and he'll sweat solder them to this piece of silver. And then that piece of silver becomes the base for his vessel. So he'll actually use that scrap. So when you turn over a Norio Tamagawa vessel, you'll see a silver bottom with these funny little triangle shaped mokume that are um, sweat soldered and then uh, planished, forged into the, the, the silver base. So uh, people can get creative to use their scraps. I've never gotten that creative to do anything with the chiseling chips, but if anyone does, let us know because that that's interest, that would be interesting to know. Okay, uh, so those of you that are here live, please stick around. But if you're watching the YouTube video, I'll just say thank you for joining us. And I would love it if you would check out my website, anvilstudio.com or my Instagram at anvilstudio. You can learn a lot more about Mokume. So thanks, thanks for joining us.